Section 1 of The Mad Planet by Murray Leinster. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. The Mad Planet by Murray Leinster. In all his lifetime of perhaps twenty years, it had never occurred to Burl to wonder what his grandfather had thought about his surroundings. The grandfather had come to an untimely end, in a rather unpleasant fashion, which Burl remembered vaguely as a succession of screams coming more and more faintly to his ears while he was being carried away at the top speed of which his mother was capable. Burl had rarely or never thought of the old gentleman since. Surely he had never wondered in the abstract of what his great-grandfather thought, and most surely of all, there never entered his head such a purely hypothetical question as the one of what his many times great-grandfather, say of the year 1920, would have thought of the scene in which Burl found himself. He was treading cautiously over a brownish carpet of fungus growth, creeping furtively toward the stream which he knew by the generic title of water. It was the only water he knew. Towering far above his head, three man-heights high, great toadstools hid the grayish sky from his sight. Clinging to the foot-thick stalks of the toadstools were still other fungi, parasites upon the growth that had once been parasites themselves. Burl himself was a slender young man, wearing a single garment twisted about his waist, made from the wing fabric of a great moth the members of his tribe had slain as it emerged from its cocoon. His skin was fair, without a trace of sunburn. In all his lifetime he had never seen the sun, though the sky was rarely hidden from view save by the giant fungi which, with monster cabbages, were the only growing things he knew. Clouds usually spread overhead, and when they did not, the perpetual haze made the sun but an indefinitely brighter part of the sky, never a sharply edged ball of fire. Fantastic mosses, misshapen fungus growths, Colossal molds and yeasts were the essential parts of the landscape through which he moved. Once, as he had dodged through the forest of huge toadstools, his shoulder touched a cream-colored stalk, giving the whole fungus a tiny shock. Instantly, from the umbrella-like mass of pulp overhead, a fine and impalpable powder fell upon him like snow. It was the season when the toadstools sent out their spores, or seeds, and they had been dropped upon him at the first sign of disturbance. Furtive as he was, he paused to brush them from his head and hair. They were deadly poison, as he knew well. Burl would have been a curious sight to a man of the twentieth century. His skin was pink, like that of a child and there was but little hair upon his body. Even that on top of his head was soft and downy. His chest was larger than his forefathers had been, and his ears seemed almost capable of independent movement, to catch threatening sounds from any direction. His eyes, large and blue, possessed pupils which could dilate to extreme size, allowing him to see in almost complete darkness. He was the result of the thirty thousand years' attempt of the human race to adapt itself to the change that had begun in the latter half of the twentieth century. At about that time, civilization had been high and apparently secure. Mankind had reached a permanent agreement among itself, and all men had equal opportunities to education and leisure. Machinery did most of the labor of the world and men were only required to supervise its operation. All men were well fed, all men were well educated, 
and it seemed that until the end of time the earth would be the abode of a community of comfortable human beings, pursuing their studies and diversions, their illusions and their truths. Peace, quietness, privacy, freedom were universal. Then, just when men were congratulating themselves that the golden age had come again, it was observed that the planet seemed ill at ease. Fissures opened slowly in the crust, and carbonic acid gas, the carbon dioxide of chemists, began to pour out into the atmosphere. That gas had long been known to be present in the air, and was considered necessary to plant life. Most of the plants of the world took the gas and absorbed its carbon into themselves, releasing the oxygen for use again. Scientists had calculated that a great deal of the Earth's increased fertility was due to the larger quantities of carbon dioxide released by the activities of man in burning his coal and petroleum. Because of those views, for some years no great alarm was caused by the continuous exhalation from the world's interior. Constantly, however, the volume increased. New fissures constantly opened, each one adding a new source of carbon dioxide, and each one pouring into the already laden atmosphere more of the gas. Beneficent in small quantities, but, as the world learned, deadly in large ones. The percentage of the heavy vapor-like gas increased. The whole body of the air became heavier through its admixture. It absorbed more moisture and became more humid. Rainfall increased. Climates grew warmer. Vegetation became more luxuriant, but the air gradually became less exhilarating. Soon the health of mankind began to be affected. Accustomed through long ages to breathe air rich in oxygen and poor in carbon dioxide, men suffered. Only those who lived on high plateaus or on tall mountain tops remained unaffected. The plants of the earth, though nourished and increasing in size beyond those ever seen before, were unable to dispose of the continually increasing flood of carbon dioxide. By the middle of the 21st century, it was generally recognized that a new carboniferous period was about to take place, when the Earth's atmosphere would be thick and humid, unbreathable by man, when giant grasses and ferns would form the only vegetation. When the 21st century drew to a close, the whole human race began to revert to conditions closely approximating savagery. The lowlands were unbearable. Thick jungles of rank growth covered the ground. The air was depressing and enervating. Men could live there, but it was a sickly, fever-ridden existence. The whole population of the earth desired the highlands, and as the low country became more unbearable, men forgot their two centuries of peace. They fought destructively, each for a bit of land where he might live and breathe. Then men began to die, men who had persisted in remaining near sea level. They could not live in the poisonous air. The danger zone crept up as the earth fishers tirelessly poured out their steady streams of foul gas. Soon men could not live within five hundred feet of sea level. The lowlands went uncultivated and became jungles of a thickness comparable only to those of the first Carboniferous period. Then men died of sheer inanition at a thousand feet. The plateaus and mountaintops were crowded with folk struggling for a foothold and food beyond the invisible menace that crept up and up. These things did not take place in one year or in ten. Not in one generation, but in several. Between the time when the chemists of the International Geophysical Institute 
announced that the proportion of carbon dioxide in the air had increased from 0.04% to 0.1%, and the time when at sea level 6% of the atmosphere was the deadly gas, more than 200 years intervened. Coming gradually as it did, the poisonous effects of the deadly stuff increased with insidious slowness. First the lassitude, then the heaviness of brain, then the weakness of body. Mankind ceased to grow in numbers. After a long period, the race had fallen to a fraction of its former size. There was room in plenty on the mountain tops, but the danger level continued to creep up. There was but one solution. The human body would have to inure itself to the poison, or it was doomed to extinction. It finally developed a toleration for the gas that wiped out race after race and nation after nation, but at a terrible cost. Lungs increased in size to secure the oxygen on which life depended, but the poison, inhaled at every breath, left the few survivors sickly and filled with a perpetual weariness. Their minds lacked the energy to cope with the new problems or transmit the knowledge which, in one degree or another, they possessed. And after thirty thousand years, Burl, a direct descendant of the first president of the Universal Republic, crept through a forest of toadstools and fungus growths. He was ignorant of fire or metals, of the uses of stone and wood. A single garment covered him. His language was a scanty group of a few hundred labial sounds, conveying no abstractions and few concrete things. He was ignorant of the uses of wood. There was no wood in the scanty territory furtively inhabited by his tribe. With the increase in heat and humidity, the trees had begun to die out. Those of northern climes went first, the oaks, the cedars, the maples. Then the pines, the beeches went early, the cypresses, and finally even the forests of the jungles vanished. Only grasses and reeds, bamboos and their kin, were able to flourish in the new steaming atmosphere. The thick jungles gave place to dense thickets of grasses and ferns, now become tree ferns again. And then the fungi took their place. Flourishing as never before, flourishing on a planet of torrid heat and perpetual miasma, on whose surface the sun never shone directly because of an ever-thickening bank of clouds that hung sullenly overhead, the fungi sprang up. About the dank pools that festered over the surface of the earth, fungus growths began to cluster. Of every imaginable shade and color, of all monstrous forms and malignant purposes, of huge size and flabby volume, they spread over the land. The grasses and ferns gave place to them. Squat footstools, flaking molds, evil-smelling yeasts, Vast mounds of fungi, inextricably mingled as to species, but growing, forever growing and exhaling an odor of dark places. The strange growths now group themselves in forests, horrible travesties on the vegetation they had succeeded. They grew and grew with feverish intensity beneath a clouded or haze-obscured sky, while above them fluttered gigantic butterflies and huge moths, sipping daintily of their corruption. The insects alone of all the animal world above water were able to endure the change. They multiplied exceedingly and enlarged themselves in the thickened air. The solitary vegetation, as distinct from fungus growths, that had survived was now a degenerate form of the cabbages that had once fed peasants. On those rank, colossal masses of foliage, the stolid grubs and caterpillars ate themselves to maturity, 
then swung below in strong cocoons to sleep the sleep of metamorphosis from which they emerged to spread their wings and fly. The tiniest butterflies of former days had increased their span until their gaily colored wings should be described in terms of feet, while the large emperor moths extended their purple sails to a breadth of yards upon yards. Burl himself would have been dwarfed beneath the overshadowing fabric of their wings. It was fortunate that they, the largest flying creatures, were harmless, or nearly so. Burl's fellow tribesmen sometimes came upon a cocoon just about to open, and waited patiently beside it until the beautiful creature within broke through its matted shell and came out into the sunlight. Then, before it had gathered energy from the air, and before its wings had swelled to strength and firmness, the tribesmen fell upon it, tearing the filmy, delicate wings from its body and the limbs from its carcass. Then, when it lay helpless before them, they carried away the juicy, meat-filled limbs to be eaten, leaving the still-living body to stare helplessly at this strange world through its many-faceted eyes and become a prey to the voracious ants who would soon clamber upon it and carry it away in tiny fragments to their underground city. Not all the insect world was so helpless or so unthreatening. Burl knew of wasps almost the length of his own body who possessed stings that were instantly fatal. To every species of wasp, however, some other insect is predestined prey, and the furtive members of Burl's tribe feared them but little as they sought only the prey to which their instinct led them. Bees were similarly aloof. They were hard put to it for existence, those bees. Few flowers bloomed, and they were reduced to expedience once considered signs of degeneracy in their race. Bubbling yeasts and fouler things, occasionally the nectarless blooms of the rank giant cabbages. Burl knew the bees. They droned overhead, nearly as large as he was himself, their bulging eyes gazing at him with abstracted preoccupation. And crickets, and beetles, and spiders. Burl knew spiders. His grandfather had been the prey of one of the hunting tarantulas, which had leaped with incredible ferocity from his excavated tunnel in the earth. A vertical pit in the ground, two feet in diameter, went down for twenty feet. At the bottom of that lair, the black-bellied monster waited for the tiny sounds that would warn him of prey approaching his hiding place. Lycosa fasciata Burl's grandfather had been careless, and the terrible shrieks he uttered as the horrible monster darted from the pit and seized him had lingered vaguely in Burl's mind ever since. Burl had seen, too, the monster webs of another species of spider, and watched from a safe distance as the misshapen body of the huge creature sucked the juices from a three-foot cricket that had become entangled in its trap. Burl had remembered the strange stripes of yellow and black and silver that crossed upon its abdomen, Epiera fasciata. He had been fascinated by the struggles of the imprisoned insect, coiled in a hopeless tangle of sticky, gummy ropes the thickness of Burl's finger, cast about its body before the spider made any attempt to approach. Burl knew these dangers. They were a part of his life. It was his accustomedness to them, and that of his ancestors, that made his existence possible. He was able to evade them, so he survived. A moment of carelessness, an instant's relaxation of his habitual caution, and he would be one of his forebears, forgotten meals of long-dead inhuman monsters. Three days before, Burl had crouched behind a bulky, shapeless fungus growth, 
while he watched a furious duel between two huge horned beetles. Their jaws, gaping wide, clicked and clashed upon each other's impenetrable armor. Their legs crashed like so many cymbals as their polished surfaces ground and struck against each other. They were fighting over some particularly attractive bit of carrion. Burl had watched with all his eyes until a gaping orifice appeared in the armor of the smaller of the two. It uttered a shrill cry, or seemed to cry out. The noise was actually the tearing of the horny stuff beneath the victorious jaws of the adversary. The wounded beetle struggled more and more feebly. At last it collapsed, and the conqueror placidly began to eat the conquered before life was extinct. Burl waited until the meal was finished, and then approached the scene with caution. An ant, the forerunner of many, was already inspecting the carcass. Burl usually ignored the ants. They were stupid, short-sighted insects, and not hunters. Save when attacked, they offered no injury. They were scavengers, on the lookout for the dead and dying, but they would fight viciously if their prey were questioned, and they were dangerous opponents. They were from three inches, for the tiny black ants, to a foot for the large termites. Burl was hasty when he heard the tiny clickings of their limbs as they approached. He seized the sharp-pointed snout of the victim, detached from the body, and fled from the scene. Later he inspected his find with curiosity. The smaller victim had been a minotaur beetle with a sharp-pointed horn like that of a rhinoceros to reinforce his offensive armament, already dangerous because of his wide jaws. The jaws of a beetle work from side to side instead of up and down, and this had made the protection complete in no less than three directions. Burl inspected the sharp, dagger-like instrument in his hand. He felt its point, and it pricked his finger. He flung it aside as he crept to the hiding place of his tribe. There were only twenty of them, four or five men, six or seven women, and the rest girls and children. Burl had been wondering at the strange feelings that came over him when he looked at one of the girls. She was younger than Burl, perhaps eighteen, and fleeter of foot than he. They talked together, sometimes, and once or twice Burl shared with her an especially succulent find of foodstuffs. The next morning he found the horn where he had thrown it, sticking in the flabby side of a toadstool. He pulled it out, and gradually, far back in his mind, an idea began to take shape. He sat for some time with the thing in his hand, considering it with a faraway look in his eyes. From time to time he stabbed at a toll-stool, awkwardly, but with gathering skill. His imagination began to work fitfully. He visualized himself stabbing food with it, as the larger beetle had stabbed the former owner of the weapon he had in his hand. Burl could not imagine himself coping with one of the fighting insects. He could only picture himself, dimly, stabbing something that was food with this death-dealing thing. It was no longer than his arm, and, though clumsy to the hand, an effective and terribly sharp implement. He thought, where was their food, food that lived, that would not fight back? Presently he rose and began to make his way toward the tiny river. Yellow-bellied newts swam in its waters. The swimming larva of a thousand insects floated about its surface or crawled upon its bottom. There were deadly things there, too. Giant crayfish snapped their horny claws at the unwary. Mosquitoes of four-inch wingspread sometimes made their humming way above the river. The last survivors of their race, 
they were dying out for lack of the plant juices on which the male of the species lived, but even so they were formidable. Burl had learned to crush them with fragments of fungus. He crept slowly through the forest of toadstools. Brownish fungus was underfoot. Strange orange, red, and purple molds clustered about the bases of the creamy toadstool stalks. Once Burl paused to run his sharp-pointed weapon through a fleshy stalk and reassure himself that what he planned was practicable. He made his way furtively through the forest of misshapen growths. Once he heard a tiny clicking and froze into stillness. It was a troop of four or five ants, each some eight inches long, returning along their habitual pathway to their city. They moved sturdily, heavily laden, along the route marked with the black and odorous formic acid exuded from the bodies of their comrades. Burl waited until they had passed, then went on. He came to the bank of the river. Green scum covered a great deal of its surface, scum occasionally broken by a slowly enlarging bubble of some gas released from decomposing matter on the bottom. In the center of the placid stream the current ran a little more swiftly and the water itself was visible. Over the shining current water spiders ran swiftly. They had not shared in the general increase of size that had taken place in the insect world. Depending upon their capillary qualities of the water to support them, an increase in size and weight would have deprived them of the means of locomotion. From the spot where Burl first peered at the water, the green scum spread out for many yards into the stream. He could not see what swam and wriggled and crawled beneath the evil-smelling covering. He peered up and down the banks. Perhaps a hundred and fifty yards below, the current came near the shore. An outcropping of rock there made a steep descent to the river, from which yellow shelf fungi stretched out. Dark red and orange above, they were light yellow below and they formed a series of platforms above the smoothly flowing stream. Burl made his way cautiously toward them. On his way he saw one of the edible mushrooms that formed so large a part of his diet, and paused to break from the flabby flesh an amount that would feed him for many days. It was too often the custom of his people to find a store of food, carry it to their hiding place, and then gorge themselves for days, eating, sleeping, and waking only to eat again until the food was gone. Absorbed as he was in his plan of trying his new weapon, Burl was tempted to return with his booty. He would give Saya of his food, and they would eat together. Saya was the maiden who roused unusual emotions in Burl, he felt strange impulses stirring within him when she was near, a desire to touch her, to caress her. He did not understand. He went on after hesitating. If he brought her food, Saya would be pleased. But if he brought her of the things that swam in the stream, she would be still more pleased. Degraded as his tribe had become, Burl was yet a little more intelligent than they. He was an atavism, a throwback to ancestors who had cultivated the earth and subjugated its animals. He had a vague idea of pride, unformed but potent. No man within memory had hunted or slain for food. They knew of meat, yes, but it had been the fragments left by an insect hunter seized and carried away by the men before the perpetually alert ant colonies had sent their foragers to the scene. If Burl did what no man before him had done, if he brought a whole carcass to his tribe, they would envy him. They were preoccupied solely with their stomachs, 
and after that with the preservation of their lives. The perpetuation of the race came third in their consideration. They were herded together in a leaderless group, coming to the same hiding place that they might share in the finds of the lucky and gather comfort from their numbers. Of weapons they had none. They sometimes used stones to crack open the limbs of the huge insects they found partly devoured, cracking them open for the sweet meat to be found inside, but they sought safety from their enemies solely in flight and hiding. Their enemies were not as numerous as might have been imagined. Most of the meat-eating insects have their allotted prey. The Sphex, a hunting wasp, feeds solely upon grasshoppers. Other wasps eat flies only. The pirate bee eats bumblebees only. Spiders were the principal enemies of man, as they devour with a terrifying impartiality all that falls into their clutches. Burl reached the spot from which he might gaze down into the water. He lay prostrate, staring into the shallow depths. Once a huge crayfish, as long as Burl's body, moved leisurely across his vision. Small fishes and even the huge newts fled before the voracious creature. After a long time, the tide of underwater life resumed its activity. The wriggling grubs of the dragonflies reappeared. Little flecks of silver swam into view, a school of tiny fish. A larger fish appeared, moving slowly through the water. Burl's eyes glistened and his mouth watered. He reached down with his long weapon. It barely touched the water. Disappointment filled him, yet the nearness and the apparent practicability of his scheme spurred him on. He considered the situation. There were the shelf fungi below him. He rose and moved to a point just above them, then thrust his spear down. They resisted its point. Burl felt them tentatively with his foot, then dared to thrust his weight to them. They held him firmly. He clambered down and lay flat upon them, peering over the edge as before. The large fish, as long as Burl's arm, swam slowly to and fro below him. Burl had seen the former owner of his spear strive to thrust it into his opponents, and knew that a thrust was necessary. He had tried his weapon upon toadstools, had practiced with it. When the fish swam below him, he thrust sharply downward. The spear seemed to bend when it entered the water, and missed its mark by inches, to Burl's astonishment. He tried again and again. He grew angry with the fish below him for eluding his efforts to kill it. Repeated strokes had left it untouched, and it was unwary and did not even try to run away. Burl became furious. The big fish came to rest directly beneath his hand. Burl thrust downward with all his strength. This time the spear, entering vertically, did not seem to bend. It went straight down. Its point penetrated the scales of the swimmer below, transfixing that lazy fish completely. An uproar began. The fish, struggling to escape, and Burl, trying to draw it up to his perch, made a huge commotion. In his excitement, Burl did not observe a tiny ripple some distance away. The monster crayfish was attracted by the disturbance and was approaching. The unequal combat continued. Burl hung on desperately to the end of his spear. Then there was a tremor in Burl's support. It gave way and fell into the stream with a mighty splash. Burl went under his eyes open, facing death. And as he sank, his wide-open eyes saw waved before him the gaping claws of the huge crayfish, 
large enough to sever a limb with a single stroke of their jagged jaws. He opened his mouth to scream, a replica of the terrible screams of his grandfather, seized by a black-bellied tarantula years before, but no sound came forth. Only bubbles floated to the surface of the water. He beat the unresisting fluid with his hands. He did not know how to swim. The colossal creature approached leisurely while Burl struggled helplessly. His arm struck a solid object and grasped it convulsively. A second later he had swung it between himself and the huge crustacean. He felt a shock as the mighty jaws closed upon the cork-like fungus, then felt himself drawn upward as the crayfish released his hold and the shell fungus floated to the surface. Having given way beneath him, it had been carried below him in his fall, only to rise within his reach just when most needed. Burl's head popped above water and he saw a larger bit of the fungus floating nearby. Less securely anchored to the rocks of the river bank than the shelf to which Burl had trusted himself, it had been dislodged when the first shelf gave way. It was larger than the fragment to which Burl clung and floated higher in the water. Burl was cool with a terrible self-possession. He seized it and struggled to draw himself on top of it. It tilted as his weight came upon it and nearly overturned, but he paid no heed. With desperate haste, he clawed with hands and feet until he could draw himself clear of the water, of which he would forever retain a slight fear. As he pulled himself upon the furry, orange-brown upper surface, a sharp blow struck his foot. The crayfish, disgusted at finally only what was to it a tasteless morsel in the shelf fungus, had made a languid stroke at Burl's wriggling foot in the water. Failing to grasp the fleshy member, the crayfish retreated, disgruntled and annoyed. And Burl floated downstream, perched, weaponless and alone, frightened and in constant danger, upon a flimsy raft composed of a degenerate fungus floating soggily in the water. He floated slowly down the stream of a river in whose waters death lurked unseen, upon whose banks was peril, and above whose reaches danger fluttered on golden wings. It was a long time before he recovered his self-possession, and when he did he looked first for his spear. It was floating in the water, still transfixing the fish whose capture had endangered Burl's life. The fish now floated with its belly upward, all life gone. So insistent was Burl's instinct for food that his predicament was forgotten when he saw his prey just out of his reach. He gazed at it, and his mouth watered, while his cranky craft went downstream, spinning slowly in the current. He lay flat on the floating fungoid, and strove to reach out and grasp the end of the spear. The raft tilted and nearly flung him overboard again. A little later he discovered that it sank more readily on one side than on the other. That was due, of course, to the greater thickness, and consequently greater buoyancy, of the part which had grown next the rocks of the river bank. Burl found that if he lay with his head stretching above that side, it did not sink into the water. He wriggled into this new position then, and waited until the slow revolution of his vessel brought the spear shaft near him. He stretched his fingers and his arm and touched, then grasped it. A moment later he was tearing strips of flesh from the side of the fish and cramming the oily mess into his mouth with great enjoyment. He had lost his edible mushroom. That danced upon the waves several yards away. But Burl ate contentedly of what he possessed. He did not worry about what was before him. That lay in the future, 
but suddenly he realized that he was being carried farther and farther from Saya, the maiden of his tribe, who caused strange bliss to steal over him when he contemplated her. The thought came to him when he visualized the delight with which she would receive a gift of part of the fish he had caught. He was suddenly stricken with dumb sorrow. He lifted his head and looked longingly at the river banks. A long, monotonous row of strangely colored fungus growths. No healthy green, but pallid, cream-colored toadstools, some bright orange, lavender, and purple molds, vivid carmine rusts and mildews, spreading up the banks from the turgid slime. The sun was not a ball of fire, but merely shone as a bright golden patch in the haze-filled sky, a patch whose limits could not be defined or marked. In the faintly pinkish light that filtered down through the air, a multitude of flying objects could be seen. Now and then a cricket or grasshopper made its bullet-like flight from one spot to another. Huge butterflies fluttered gaily above the silent, seemingly lifeless world. Bees lumbered anxiously about, seeking the cross-shaped flowers of the monster cabbages. Now and then a slender-waisted, yellow-stomached wasp flew alertly through the air. Burl watched them with a strange indifference. The wasps were as long as he himself. The bees, on end, could match his height. The butterflies ranged from tiny creatures, barely capable of shading his face, to colossal things in the folds of whose wings he could have been lost. And above him fluttered dragonflies, whose long, spindle-like bodies were three times the length of his own. Burl ignored them all. Sitting there, an incongruous creature of pink skin and soft brown hair, upon an orange fungus floating in midstream, he was filled with despondency because the current carried him forever farther and farther from a certain slumber-lind maiden of his tiny tribe, whose glances caused an odd commotion in his breast. End of section one. Recording by Roger Moline.